scripture that's given in Psalm 92 is said, For you shall make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. Hymn number 120 is a song called Make Me Glad. Let's stand as we worship the Lord and celebrate the Lord's blessings. strength, our strong tower. Uh, what, a, what a blessing to know him. And uh, I hope that you came this morning expecting what God's going to do in this place today. Um, we are uh, taking up for Carlos, Brother Carlos today. Um, and so uh, if you'd like to give to Brother Carlos, if you'll just mark that on your envelope. I think you've actually got an envelope in your bulletin uh, this week. So uh, you can put it in there if you'd like to. Uh, also, just any gift you want to give um, in your tithe or offering or whatever uh, can be given in the foyer. There's a black box there as you turn right to go out. If you kind of look behind you, there's a black box there on the wall. Then also there's a, a white box here at the side entrance. Uh, you can also give by mailing it or give it southclintonbaptist.org. And so we, we appreciate your generosity and uh, your love for the Lord and, and the worship of God's people in giving. So, uh, 
Also, uh, we have a, our theme this year is Faith is the Victory. I, I included a little insert here for you, and had Kay do this, just to uh, get you to ask the Lord, to challenge you to ask the Lord, Lord, is there something you would like me to do to get out of my comfort zone? Yeah, because sometimes faith takes us out of our comfort zone, doesn't it? So uh, God may say nothing to your heart, and if he says nothing to your heart, that's just perfectly okay. Uh, but I thought I would give, give you this and, and encourage you to pray this week and just say, Lord, is there something you would have me surrender to that's out of my comfort zone? And then next week I'm going to remind you about that and encourage you as we have our prayer time uh, to surrender to follow God in that step of faith he's asking you to take. Now, we also also had last time, uh, at the very beginning of the year, we had uh, some things God wants us to trust him for in the coming year. Hope you're still lifting those to God in prayer uh, and uh, asking God to help you trust him for those things he wants to do. And uh, I'm excited about what God's going to do in the future. He may get us out of our comfort zone, but that's a good thing because if we're out of our comfort zone, we're going to see God work in a new and a powerful way, and we'll get to see just how big he is. So uh, I'm excited about that. All right. Uh, next Sunday, Lord willing, if uh, nothing changes and things have been pretty stable uh, with the numbers for, for COVID and everything, uh, we're going to start back at uh, stage two, the, the way we were doing before uh, with our Sunday night and Wednesday night service as well. So we did Sunday school this morning. We will do Sunday school again next week, but then also our Sunday night and Wednesday night service. And so uh, if you'd like to be involved in those things, we're going to encourage you to do that. And we will be distancing. We've got those things marked off and everything. So uh, and uh, if, we, if we just have an overflow of people on Wednesday night, we just move somewhere where there's room. How's that? So, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll deal with that. But uh, I'm excited about getting back in those regular schedule with God's people. And uh, continue to pray for our community, and uh, we'll continue to pray for you guys this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price for our sin and rose again. And Lord, I pray that uh, this morning any who don't know him in this place uh, would be saved would put their trust in Jesus. And God, I pray for those in our prayer box and our Operation Andrew list and our, our, our prayer list that, that we have for, for those who are lost. And uh, God, we lift them to you. We pray for the working of your Holy Spirit to draw them to faith in Jesus. Uh, Lord, we pray for the enabling power of your Holy Spirit to enable a genuine repentance and trust in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know apart from you we can do nothing. And even in that decision of faith, we need you. And so, Lord, we, we lift these people up to you for that very thing. But God, also pray for those here today who are struggling with various things. Your people, Lord, you know exactly what's on people's hearts and minds. And Lord, I pray that you'd minister to each and every heart today. And I pray, Father, that your purposes would be achieved in each life. Um, Lord, we, uh, we pray that your spirit would enable us to worship you and to respond to you in the ways that you desire. Thank you for allowing us to meet together and for protecting us, God. And we ask that you continue that. Uh, Father, lift up our eyes to Jesus as we spend this time with you. We pray in his name. Amen. In the minds of a, of a lot of people, uh, God, God's commands are uh, to take away our crumb. But you know the Bible says that the commands of the Lord are not, are not grievous. They're not to, to grieve us, but they are to bring us joy. And of course we know that the greatest command, uh, Jesus answers that question. As he taught the people, the greatest command that's given to us is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the song has been written about this. It's a, it's a joyous song, an upbeat song. So let's stand as we sing. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing together. Love the Lord.
pray for your anointing upon him as he stands. And Lord, I pray that you give us each day a new appreciation for your love for us, for all that you provide. Now you provide your word. And we gladly receive it. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1. David, as a teenager, King David, had been sent by Jesse to bring food to his brothers who were lined up for battle against the Philistines. And as David came, he heard the giant Goliath taunting the people of Israel and speaking against their God. And Goliath was challenging them, if you've got someone, send him out so that we can fight. And no one would come. Everybody was terrified. But David said, who is this vile Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David went to Saul and he said, look, uh, your servant will take care of this guy for you. God empowered me to kill a lion, to kill a bear. This Philistine will be like one of them. And he went out and he picked five smooth stones because Goliath had four brothers. And he went out to face Goliath and he took his slingshot, a little different than the slingshots we have today. Took that slingshot and he threw that stone and it hit Goliath right in the forehead, sunk into his forehead and killed him. Like that. He fell like a log. And Israel won a mighty victory. I want to tell you something. Our God is able. He could take a teenage boy to conquer a giant. He can use you and I. And he wants us to have the faith to trust him and to obey him and what he has for us to do. The Israelites had come across the wilderness. God had sustained them with manna from heaven and water from a rock. He had dried up the Jordan before them so they could cross over. And now they stand on the outskirts of Jericho. And God has a challenge for them to fulfill. He says, I want you to take Jericho. And he said, this is how I want you to do it. He said, you're going to march around the city one time a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, you're going to march seven times around. And you're going to blow the trumpets. Had some priests with some trumpets. And you're going to shout. And the Lord will deliver to you the city. Kind of a strange battle plan. But God called them to, to step forward in faith and fulfill what God had for them. You know, you and I need to live by faith. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. If we are to move forward as God's people, and if the kingdom of God is to move forward in this country and around the world, we as God's people have to walk by faith. And faith is really simple. Sometimes it's not simple to, to do. We have to have the Holy Spirit's help for it. But it's simple in terms of what you, what you uh, do in the process. And that is, first of all, God lets you know what you're to do. Okay? It's not just blind faith in something that uh, you come up with. Okay? It's faith in what God says. Either through his word or through his Holy Spirit impressed upon your heart. This is what I want you to do. And as you step out and as you follow God uh, in faith, God delivers the victory. And so we as God's people need to take the steps of faith God calls us to take and trust him to be right there with us in the process. Um, the title of my message today is Taking Time to trust. Taking time to trust. 
Um, you say, well, why do I take time to trust? I mean, I thought you just trust or you don't. Uh, what, what do you mean take time to trust? Well, I'm going to get there, okay? But uh, there is such a thing as taking time to trust God. And setting aside time in your quiet time, time uh, throughout your day, uh, to build your faith so that you can accomplish the things that God has for you to accomplish. And I think we'll find these principles here in the scripture. Look with me at uh, Joshua 6 and verse 1. Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites. No one was leaving or entering. The Lord said to Joshua, look, I have handed Jericho, its king, and its best soldiers over to you. March around the city with all the men of war, circling the city one time. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horn trumpets in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times while the priests blow the trumpets. When there is a prolonged blast of a horn and you hear its sound, have all the troops give a mighty shout. Then the city wall will collapse and the troops will advance, each man straight ahead. So Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and have seven priests carry seven trumpets in front of the Ark of the Lord. He said to the troops, Move forward. March around the city and have the armed men go ahead of the ark of the Lord. After Joshua had spoken to the troops, seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord moved forward and blew the trumpets. The ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. While the trumpets were blowing, the armed men went in front of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard went behind the ark. But Joshua had commanded the troops, Do not shout or let your voice be heard. Don't let one word come out of your mouth until the time I say shout. Then you are to shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the city, circling it once. They returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning. The priest took the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying seven trumpets marched in front of the, Lord, uh, the ark of the Lord. While the trumpets were blowing, the armed men went in front of them, and the rear guard went behind the ark of the Lord. On the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, and they did this for six days. Early on the seventh day, they started at dawn and marched around the city seven times in the same way. Uh, that was the only day they marched around the city seven times. After the seventh time, the priests blew the trumpets, and Joshua said to the troops, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. But the city and everything in it are set apart to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and everyone with her in the house will live because she hid the messengers we sent. But keep yourselves from the things set apart or you will be set apart for destruction. If you take any of those things, you will be set apart. Uh, you will set apart the camp of Israel for destruction and make trouble for it. For all the silver and gold, the articles of bronze and iron are dedicated to the Lord and must go to the Lord's treasury. So the troops shouted, and the trumpets sounded. When they heard the blast of the trumpet, the troops gave a great shout, and the walls collapsed. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. They completely destroyed everything in the city with a sword, every man and woman, young and old, every ox, sheep, and donkey. So taking time to trust. Uh, the Israelites had a long, drawn-out process. Um, I've heard somebody, uh, probably one of my friends say, uh, when I was growing up, if you want to win a fight, hit the guy first. You know, I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but uh, oftentimes we think of the person that will win the fight as the person who most decisively takes action, who quickly and aggressively acts for victory, but that's not what God told them to do. He said, I want you to wait. I want you to march around the city. I often thought, when, it, when I was a, a kid, I'd read this story and I'd think, well, what, did, what do they do? Were they just bored out of their minds? What, you know, as they marched around the city, they couldn't say anything. What were they doing? I believe that God had them do this so that 
they could be preparing themselves to fail. And then the wrath of God that came upon the people of the land prophesied 400 years before. You remember God told Abraham the sins of the Canaanites has not yet reached its full measure would be carried out through the people of Israel except for Rahab who repented and put their trust in God. Now Lord willing we're going to talk a little bit more about that aspect of the conquest uh, in a week or two but I just want you to know there is a wrath of God to shun. Sometimes we forget that. Yes, God so loved the world and gave his son, but God also hates sin. He's not against one people group or another because he saves Rahab, right? She's a Canaanite. Uh, he's, it's not that God is, is against one country and not another. No, God is is for all who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But he hates sin. And if we reject the provision of his son Jesus Christ, there is nothing left but the wrath and justice of a holy God. So, so taking time to trust. Uh, how can we do this? How can we take time to build our faith and move forward for God. Well, first of all, we need to anticipate, we need to be anticipating God's promises. Anticipating God's promises. Look at verse 3. March around the city with all the men of war, circling the city one time. And do this for six days. Now, I've heard some convoluted stories before about in theories of people who want to try to deny the supernatural power of God, he says, well, uh, it was because the people were walking around the city, you know, the walls became unstable and they fell. What? No, this is the supernatural power of God. They, didn't, they weren't walking around the city to weaken the walls. Most of the walls I've seen don't get weakened by people just walking around them, unless maybe it's something a kid built. Okay? But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, walls are built to stay. So why are they walking around? Well, they're walking around to anticipate the promises of God. They've had an eventful season. They just walked across the Jordan River on dry ground. Wow. I, I wish I could have been there to see how high the waters went. To see the spectacle of what God had done. They had been fed with manna and water from a rock for 40 years in the wilderness. God had sustained them. Their shoes had worn out. All the, uh, all the shoe stores would have gone out of business because there were no Israelites buying shoes in the wilderness. God preserved their footwear supernaturally. And I think as they walked around the city, it gave them time to think about what God had done. But not just what God had done, but what God was doing. As they walked around the city, they were able to remember, I'm in the promised land. We're here. God has fulfilled his promise. What an awesome thing. The things that Abraham heard about 400 years ago have been realized. The things that we've longed for as we saw the people of the first generation pass away in the wilderness, what we longed for, what we hoped for, has been realized. Hallelujah. We're in the promise land. But not just what God had done, not just what God was doing, but what God was about to do. Because as they were walking around the walls of the city, God had told them what was going to happen. The walls were going to fall. Now, Jericho had impressive walls. You could drop chariots on them. And they had 
separated walls. The walls were separated from each other. They had two different walls with a space in between to make it more difficult for people to breach the city. God said those walls were going to come down. All except for the part where Rahab was. Because remember she lived in the wall? So apparently all the wall fell except for the place where Rahab was. Kind of cool. Anyway, <clears throat> as they walked around the city, they got to visualize this is what God is going to do. Sometimes God gives you a promise. He gives us many promises in his word. Sometimes he gives you a promise upon your heart. I remember when I was uh, uh, praying for my daughter one morning when, when uh, she was sick with her, with her first illness that she had. and uh, I'd been very concerned and, and God just kind of touched my heart. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I just sensed that it was going to be okay and I didn't have to worry about it. Well, you know, I didn't really want to publicize that because I thought, well, you know, I, maybe that's me and maybe I haven't heard God correctly or anything. I was talking to my mom one day and mentioned it to her and she said, I had the same thing happen to me the other day. Well, then I thought, well, that's God. <laughs> he's, he's, told, he's told me, he's told her, I'm just going to be confident. I'm just going to believe it. And so uh, I began to thank and praise God for that. And, uh, and, and God did answer that prayer. And she gave testimony here in our church and how God had healed her. And uh, yeah, our God is an awesome God. And so we can anticipate that God's promises. Abraham did this, right? God said, listen, you, I'm not giving it to you right now, but this, every, every place you go, all the places you're looking at are going to be yours. And God tells him, walk around in the land. Why? What was Abraham doing as he walked around? He was anticipating the promises of God. He was looking and saying, hey, that creek's mine. See that mountain peak over there? That's mine. God's giving it to me. And he's rejoicing in advance about what God is going to do. I, I, I got excited this morning when we, in Sunday school. We were talking about heaven. And the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and all that God's going to do. And, and I began to, to think about just the significance of that and what God was going to do. And I started to get happy with Jesus. And I <laughs> excited to everything I could do to start spitting and preaching right there in the Sunday school class. But uh, listen, God has given us great promises. So we need to take time to trust him and anticipate those promises. Rehearse the things God has done that he is doing and that he will do. So in taking time to trust, uh, how, how can we do that to uh, build our faith? Uh, we need to spend time anticipating his promises. Secondly, remembering God's power. Remembering God's power. Now this, this chapter is very repetitive because he's making some points here. One of the things you see over and over again in this chapter is the mention of the ark of God. Verse 4. Have seven priests carry seven ram swords in front of the ark. What is the ark? The ark of the covenant of God. This was the place where the Shekinah glory of God descended upon the tabernacle uh, over the ark of the covenant. It was the place where God was seen as ruling above the cherubim. And uh, with the foundation of his law uh, as, as his rulership and leadership for the nation. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of God's presence among the people of God. And so why does God tell the Ark to go around the city with the, with the fighting men? Because he wanted the people to see every single day that God was with them. You're not going to go take this city of Jericho by yourself. God himself is going with you. Remember his power. I wonder as they were walking around the city, if one of them 
catching a glimpse of the ark. Thought of that glorious day when God descended as they finished the tabernacle. The Shekinah glory of God came down upon the tabernacle and filled the place. No one could enter, and it was just everywhere. And, and the, the cloud was veiling his, his presence, but uh, everyone could see and sense the power and the glory of God that was with them. Must have been a fantastic day. First time in the history of mankind where anything like that had happened to any group of people. God was with them. Every, every time they broke camp, it was because the Shekinah glory cloud lifted up and moved to the front of the camp. And it was their signal. It's time to break camp and to move wherever the cloud goes, right? Because that's what they were to do. Pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. And so God's presence had carried them through the wilderness. God's presence was going to help them conquer the land. He was with them. Um, each time something significant happened in the, in the country and uh, there was a dispute or Moses had a message for the people, uh, he would come and he would meet with the elders before the tabernacle of God in God's presence. And it was a sign that God was at the center of national life. We hear... Under the new covenant, if God be for you, who can be against you? Isn't that great? God be against you, who can be for you? Both things are true. So God is with them. And so we need to remember the power of God. As they saw the ark, they were reminded of the Red Sea and the miraculous crossing. They were reminded of the manna and the and the water from the rock, and all the ways that God had been with them. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. But I'm going to tell you something. I know there's a lot of crazy things going on in our culture right now. I know there's a lot of wicked things happening. A lot of things our government's doing and things that are, that are just plain wicked. But I want to tell you something. No matter what we go through, no matter what we face, Jesus is with us. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Remember his power. Listen, he, he doesn't get in a sweat thinking about what's going on in Washington, D.C. Or anywhere else for that matter. He is king of kings and lord of lords. The host of the angels bow to him. He speaks. And the winds and the waves have to obey He is God, very God. Remember God's power. Sometimes uh, we just need to get our eyes back on Jesus. We get all distressed and worried and, oh, what's going to happen? The sky is falling. What are we going to do? Lift your eyes to Jesus. As Peter sunk beneath the waves... He's looking at the storm instead of looking at Jesus. And Jesus pulled him up. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on the water. The storm that was intended to destroy becomes the path upon which he walks. Our God can take what's evil and work it for good. That's the God he is. We can walk on top of it because he's with us. Remember God's by the way, remember God's power in, in your relationship with Him and asking God to help you with the different things that you're facing in your personal relationship with Him. Ask God to help you in your family situations. Remember God's power. He is able to help us with our marriages, with our kids, with, with all the things that we face. Remember His help in your workplace. Somebody once said as long as there are tests in school, there will be prayer in school. Uh, remember God's power. He can intervene wherever we are. Can I tell you the same God that brought the plagues on Egypt was with them in the promised land. And he's with us today. Hallelujah. So, taking time to trust. 
uh, we need to spend time anticipating God's promises, remembering God's power, thirdly, relying on God's intercessor. I love this. He says, verse 4, have seven priests. By the way, seven is the number of spiritual completion. Can I tell you, Jesus has all you need. <laughs> The priest, what was the significance of the priest in the Old Testament? Well, they were mediators between men and God, but they were also a picture of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Every morning and evening, the priests were to offer the sacrifice and to worship God and to lift up intercessory prayer on behalf of the people. Jesus, the New Testament tells us, ever lives to make intercession for us. So as the priest walked around with the ark, the people and the, and the fighting men could be reminded, someone's praying for you. Today, we certainly can be reminded Jesus is lifting us up before the throne. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, I want to tell you, there's nobody that prays like Jesus. There's nobody that knows the will of God like Jesus. There's nobody with the wisdom to pray like Jesus. And he is praying for you. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's my prayer partner. I like that. <laughs> Jesus intercedes for the saints. Isn't it amazing how every record of Christianity has at different times of history, has been tried to, they've tried to destroy it. Tried to destroy the records, tried to destroy the Bibles, tried to destroy the Christians themselves and remove every trace of Christianity from under heaven. And the kingdom of God keeps moving forward. How? Jesus is praying for us. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's great. Um, so we can rely on him. Joshua, standing before the, the Lord, he needed the intercessor. He needed Jesus to come and help him out uh, and put the robe of righteousness upon him so he could be in God's presence. Uh, Jesus helps us in our Christian walk. He helps us in our prayer life. He helps us with, with every facet of life, and he also intercedes for us. And you can ask him to intercede for you. One of the, the most tender places in Scripture is the high priestly prayer of Jesus found in John 17 where he begins to pray for his disciples. He knows what's coming. He knows what's coming in our lives too, doesn't he? He's praying in advance. He's saying, Lord, I know that this is going to happen. I know that the world's going to hate them just as it hated me. Lord, I know that they're going to face trouble, but God... Be with them. Can, can I tell you, whatever you may face in your walk with God, He already knew about it before He got there. And He's already prayed for it. So, they would be reminded of the intercessory prayer. By the way, praise God for His people. The fact that we can pray for each other and be led by the Holy Spirit in that to support each other. Such an encouragement. So um, we need to spend time, and taking time to trust, we need to spend time anticipating God's promises, remembering God's power, relying on God's intercessor. I like this one. Celebrating God's activity. Celebrating God's activity. Verse 4, he says, Have seven priests carry the seven ram's horns. Ram's horn trumpets, or the shofar is the, is the Hebrew word. Some of you have probably seen them blow the shofar. The blowing of the shofar was used in, sometimes in context of battle, but it was also used in other things. Uh, it was used in worship. Blow the trumpets <laughs> and announce that he is king. Uh, the trumpets were used to remind the people of significant things that God had done. 
And so it was a time of celebration of God's activity. So yes, they're blowing the trumpets because God's about to give them the city. That's part of it. But it's also a celebration of all that God has done and is doing. I've mentioned that before. So as the trumpets of celebration are blowing, and they're worshiping God, the people are reminded of the good things that God has done. Listen, if you turn on the news today, you will hear every kind of bad news you can imagine. Sometimes it makes me glad, or not, hardly ever makes me glad. Sometimes it makes me sad. Sometimes it makes me mad. But when I look at Jesus, I'm glad. God is at work. Can I tell you something? God hasn't advocated his throne. He is at work. We saw the waters of baptism stir a couple weeks ago. People are coming to Christ. People are being encouraged. People are being strengthened in their walk with God. God is at work. I heard uh, a week or two ago about a couple of places in California where revival has broken out. You don't hear that on CNN. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. God is at work. Don't you let the devil take away your joy. Our God is greater. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are the people of victory. Somewhere I read that the tomb is empty. That Jesus came out of it. Hallelujah. Listen, we can't fail as God's people. As we serve God, we are rewards. As they persecute us, Jesus said, get all excited and do a happy dance. Great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. If they put us to death, they promote us to glory. We cannot fail. And Jesus is coming. One day the command's going to be given and the bodies are going to come out of the graves. And we're going to be changed and enter the hope for which we're created. We'll be marching around heaven. <laughs> we're here. It's the promised land. Hallelujah. We're here. Check out those gemstones on that foundation. You know, uh, It's going to be amazing. Celebrate God's activity. You know, one of the most powerful things you can do as a child of God for your faith is to be a person of thanksgiving and praise. Amen. God, thank you for what you've done in my life. Right? The Bible tells us in everything give thanks. And if God takes everything and he works it for good, even though things in and of themselves may be bad, we can thank God that he's going to take those things and work them for good. Lord, I may not know what the good is, but I thank you that somehow you're going to work good out of this situation. We can thank him for the simple things he's given us. There are many things we enjoy every single day. One of my favorite is a good cup of coffee. I love me some coffee. And I enjoy it. I listen, I, I keep Starbucks in business. I'm going to tell you. Uh, it, it's amazing. God has given me the pleasure of enjoying that. You can, you can thank God for what you eat. And I'm not just saying a quick Thanksgiving before your meal. That's good. I'm, I hope you do that. But thank it. If you have something that just blows your socks up, say, boy, is this good. Thank you, Lord. What about the roof that you have over your head? Or the clothes that you wear. Or your health. What about your kids? What about the fact that God has answered prayer? Listen, as you begin to think about all the things that God has done for you, you will have an attitude shift. 
and your shift will be, you'll be taking your eyes off the waves and putting them on Jesus. It will be from frustration, fear, struggle, whatever the case may be, to peace. Because a shift will happen in your heart as you celebrate what God's doing. But also as you celebrate what he's going to do. You can celebrate sometimes generally. If God calls you to do something for him, there's some service you're doing, uh, something God has gifted you to do by his Holy Spirit. You can thank him for the results that are going to come for that. Right? If it's his will for you to do it, he's going to bless it, right? And if it's his will for you to do it, he's going to be with you in it. And so God's going to work and he's going to move and you can thank him in advance because his call ensures that he goes with you. Sometimes he'll give you a specific thing. This is what I'm going to do. And you can thank him for that. But, but celebrate what he is doing. Sometimes the times of my life where I thought they were an utter waste and I wondered where God was were the times that God did the most profound work in my life. He's at work all the time. Jesus said, my father is working. Amen. And I too am working. <laughs> you see, the main part of that is that God is working, right? We may join him in his work, but he does the heavy lifting. We can celebrate the activity of God. What has God done this week in your life? Has he used you to be a blessing to somebody else? Praise his name, you're going to receive a reward. As you've honored God, as you put him first, as you've spoken for Jesus Christ, he'll reward you for that. Has he given you joy in his presence? Celebrate. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your comfort. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that my sins have been washed away past, present, future, that you clothe me in the spotless righteousness of your son's garment. Thank you for the fact that I have access to your presence, that I stand in your grace. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Isn't that a great activity of God? <laughs> His mercies are new every morning. You ever have one of those days when you just felt like you blew it in every conceivable way? I've come in the, in the time uh, with God. I was like, okay, well, where do I begin? How, how many ways have I blown it yesterday? And I'm reminded His mercies are new every morning. Celebrate the activity of God in your life. God's answer to prayer, celebrate. Talk to other Christians about it. Let, God, uh, let them know what God has said to you in your quiet time with Him. As he leads you to do so. Let them know the scripture that blessed your heart. Celebrate what God is doing. I think they were celebrating. As they blew these trumpets. Years later a king uh, of the nation of Judah named Jehoshaphat. Would uh, be told by God to send the singers in front of the army. The singers aren't usually who you want in the front lines of your army, right? But God told him, put the singers in front. And these singers were worshiping God. And the power of God fell and threw the opposing army into confusion. And they won the battle because their enemy killed each other. That's the power of God. As we worship him as we celebrate what he's doing. There's a spiritual power to that. And it builds our faith so that we can move forward and accomplish what God has put before us to accomplish. So taking time to trust, we need to spend time anticipating God's promises, remembering God's power, relying on God's intercessor, celebrating God's activity, and finally shouting of God's victory. I love this. Verse 5. When there is a prolonged blast of the horn and you hear it sound, have all the troops give a mighty shout. 
Now, if they've been thinking about all that God has done as they're walking around six days, God just said, don't you say anything. And then the seventh day, they're walking around seven times. Don't you say anything until I tell you to shout. I think they were so full of the joy of the Lord and so full of the faith as they thought about what God had done. When the time Joshua said, shout, they said, woo, yeah. Look at what God's going to do. And the power of God started moving all over that place. And the walls fell down beneath them and they went in and won the victory. He said, it's okay to shout even if you're Baptist. It's okay. It's okay to be excited about the Lord. I, I, was, uh, I was driving along in my car a couple of weeks ago and I was listening to this song about heaven. I don't remember what song it was. I was thinking, man, I need to remember that song so I can download it when I forgot it. But... Uh, it was about heaven, and I, I started hearing, hearing about it, and I started getting excited, and I, I just didn't like, I don't know if somebody saw me or not, I just, I started shouting, I just was excited in Jesus about what he was going to do. Listen, it's okay to get excited about what God is doing and what he's going to do, and we can be joyful as God's people. I think that's the, that's the character quality of spirit-filled life, right? What did Paul tell us the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, right? But joy is right there at the top. Joy is the heritage of God's people. Don't let the world rob, it to, rob you of your joy. I, there was an old Gaither song years ago. It said, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. This happy face I wear, Jesus put it there to stay. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. I like that. Listen, my heart has been saved by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And nothing can take that away from me. Hallelujah. I am bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm adopted into the family of God. I'm his son. I have a heaven as my hope and my future. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. We need to shout God's victory. As we think about the greatness of who our God is, as we meditate on Him, our faith will be strengthened. Years later, King David would write, about the blessing that comes to the man who meditates on the Word of God. Meditation is just simply thinking about what the Word of God says. Okay? It, it, taking unhurried time to think about what it says. He says, He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. He'll be fruitful. His leaf also shall not wither. No matter what comes, whatsoever he does shall prosper. You see, if you're walking by faith, God himself enters into the equation with you and brings the blessing and prosperity and fulfillment of his purpose that we need. Taking time to trust. Yes, those six times for six days, or one time a day for six days, and the seven times on the seventh day had a purpose. It was taking time to trust God for what He was about to do so that they could shout in victory. Would it be great to shout in victory over what God does in your child's life, Amen. or in your marriage, or at your workplace, or in this church? What if God brought revival to this church? I'm ready. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be great? Maybe that person you've been praying for for so many years to be saved. What if they got saved? That's the God we serve. Amen. My next door neighbor in Texas was in his 80s. He had 12 kids and 11 of the 12 kids were believers. He had tried to reach him for years and prayed for him for years. He was saved two months before his death. It's never too late. 
Father, we thank you for the amazing power that you have, for your amazing goodness to include us in the process of your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you'd help us trust you. God, give us the heart, Lord, to take the time that is needed to focus upon you, to remember what you've done, to thank and praise you for what you've done so that we can shout in victory. And Lord, thank you for the victory that will ultimately come when Jesus returns. And Lord, for those who are here today, I pray for any decision that needs to be made. Father, for your people, if there's something that uh, we need to trust you with, God, that you would lay that upon our hearts and help us to say, Lord, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief if we need to. But help us to trust you. And God, if there's something that you've been calling us to do, but we've been reluctant to answer the call, I pray, Lord, that you'll give us the strength and grace through your spirit to say yes to Jesus. Lord, for those who are here today that don't know Christ, I, I pray that uh, you would be at work to draw them to faith in you. Give them the courage, the ability to genuinely repent and put their trust in Jesus. And I pray it in his name. Amen. We just encourage you, if you're a child of God, say, Lord, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief in your heart right now. Let's trust him for the days ahead. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, you can just surrender to him. Jesus paid it all. He died for your sin. He lived the perfect life you couldn't live. He rose again. And because of what Jesus has done, you can be forgiven and given eternal life. And it's, it just involves a surrender to his purpose and faith and the receiving of the gift of eternal life. And so if you'd like to do that, you just say, Lord, I surrender. I trust you and I receive the gift of eternal life. If you'd like some help with that, I'd be happy to lead you in a, in a prayer here at the front as we close. But if you need prayer this morning, uh, feel free to come forward and I'd be happy to, to pray with you this morning. And uh, let's go out and see what God will do this week. We're dismissed.